So you want to see pretty things, huh? Something for your tired eyes to feast upon. Uh, not the background, although that's quite nice too. We're talking blades. I think there's something quintessentially human about turning a weapon into art. You know, a piece of fanciful craftsmanship that can be admired and enjoyed, but ultimately represents hierarchy and violence. So let's look at a few. Many of these, if not most, were not actually designed for combat, but rather as status symbols or ceremonial objects. Uh, I've had a hard time trying to decide how to rank them, so I'm just going in chronological order. By the way, I wasn't including or excluding any time periods or cultures specifically. My selections are kind of semi-random. I try to mix it up, but uh, don't think too much into it. First, I just had to pick Pharaoh Tutankhamun's daggers. Now, these are from Egypt's Old Kingdom period, around 4,600 years old. And this is the one that tends to steal the show, so to speak. That's what gets the most attention because it's made of meteoric iron, which of course captures people's imagination. Uh, the handle is also quite spectacular. It's made of fine gold, decorated with granulated patterns, and cloisonné, which is an enameling technique. Uh, basically, you glue or solder thin metal wire, typically copper or bronze, to the surface, and the cells formed by the wire, called cloisons, are inlaid with gems or filled with colored glass paste and then fired to harden it. There's another nice example the dagger of Princess Ita, which is also made with cloisonné. Here's a close-up so you can better see how vibrant the colors are and how much the contrast between the shiny metal and the colored enamel pops. And this technique has been used for all kinds of objects. You can see how visually striking it is. Meteoric iron is the only naturally occurring metallic form of iron, as opposed to ore. So just imagine the sheer wonder of this iron from the sky in the Bronze Age. You know, this material that people otherwise didn't have access to because they weren't able to smelt iron from ore yet, which was superior to bronze, you know, fell down from the heavens. You know, you could easily imagine how this would be seen as a gift from the gods. What also makes it special is its high nickel content of 11%. That makes it a stainless alloy, which is why it's so amazingly well preserved. If we take a closer look here, you can still see the mirror polish on this. After all this time, that's impressive. Usually iron artifacts are heavily corroded. As valuable as the blade is, the handle is definitely not to be ignored. It has a pommel made of clear rock crystal, and inside is another pommel or a tank cap made of decorated gold. You can see the details best in this impressive 3D model here. I'll link the artist in the description below. Just Imagine how many hours of patient work this required, especially with Bronze Age tools. You can see the granulation here, you know, all these little dots, every little thing made by hand, all these inlays, and even on the piece inside. This is hard to see in pictures. There are other examples of crystal pommels as well, like this medieval arming sword here. The other dagger is of course also worthy of a pharaoh, it has an engraved gold blade and a very similar handle, except that this one has a metal pommel instead of crystal. And then we've got the sheath over there, which is also gold and has embossed animal scenes of predators attacking prey. The craftsman had a refined sense of aesthetics, that's for sure. I mean, just look at it. I think personally, I actually prefer the metal pommel because it has more cloisonné there, and it's just so nicely done. Such beautiful contrast. It's colorful, but not too much so. Anyway, we've got a lot to look at, so let's move on. Next up, daggers found in Mycenaean graves, around 3,500 years old. 
What makes them special is the blades. At first glance, the blades look like iron, but they're actually made of bronze or possibly a gold copper alloy that was artificially patinated, similar to Japanese shakudo. You might have seen this style on katana fittings. Silver and gold inlays depict various animals in hunting scenes. Uh, they carved figures into the surface of the bronze, then hammered a gold and silver foil into it and polished it afterwards. That's how they created that effect. There's a beautiful reproduction at the British Museum, which gives you a better idea of what this might have looked like back then. So you can see the contrast quite clearly between the gold and the blackened bronze. This one's my favorite, with an intertwined swirl pattern that becomes gradually smaller and tighter along the blade. Just looks amazing. Mycenaeans also made entire hills of gold. Here's one with lion heads and decorative swirls on the handle. Taking quite a leap forward in history, this is a sword from a Vendel period grave around 700, which is a century before the Viking Age. Originally, this was inlaid with garnets right here, which are lost now, but Patrick Barda has made a reproduction that shows it in its full glory right here. So there you can see the garnets right there. And of course, the material isn't corroded, so you can see a lot better uh, what it would have looked like. The hilt is made of uh, silver and gilded bronze. Here's a nice close-up where you can see the intricate patterns carved into the metal. You've got intertwined abstracted animal designs and interwoven geometric patterns. With this art style, it can be difficult to see the animals because they are so abstracted, so sometimes it just looks like geometric shapes. It has a ring attached to the pommel right here, which is seen on many swords from the migration period, uh, roughly 300 to 800, by the way. This is typically interpreted as an oath ring, and the background is that Germanic warriors chose a leader and swore their life to, the, to him. So this is symbolic, clearly doesn't have a practical purpose. Here we've got a 6th to 7th century Merovingian pommel, now, the ring on this one broke off. It also shows a very common element in migration period art, which is, again, cloisonné. These are hilt and scabbard parts of the Sword of Childeric, a Frankish king who reigned between 458 and 481. Here's a gorgeous example of a sword pommel covered in cloisonné. A red garnet was a very popular material for filling these thick walled cloisson cells. The patience and craftsmanship is impressive, to say the least. But you don't need inlaid gems for astonishing visual effect. This is an Anglo-Saxon open-work pommel from the mid to late 8th century made of gilded silver. It's not something that you want to fight with, it's just too delicate, but it's magnificent artwork from a very different part of the world, this is an Aztec sacrificial dagger called Tecpat. From what I've read in Aztec mythology, there was a flint-shaped deity cast down from heaven by his brother who shattered into 1,600 fragments on earth, which each turned into a god, and hence the depictions of a knife blade with a face. There's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship made between 1400 and 1521. The handle is made of cedro wood, adorned with a mosaic of turquoise, malachite, and various types of shell, which were glued on with pine resin, and originally was fully covered. I found an impressively detailed 3D recreation of this knife. I thought it was real at first when I saw the picture. Uh, we'll also link the artist below. Um, he didn't randomly add pokeballs, by the way. Uh, those appear to be eyes. That gives you a better impression of just how tiny some of these pieces are that must have required a steady hand to put together. Just amazing visual effect. Here's a sword owned by Cesare Borgia, 1475 to 1507, illegitimate son of Pope Alexander VI and Duke of Valentino. The sword is typically dated between 1493 and 1498. It has a double fullered blade etched with classical iconography based around the life of Julius Caesar, because apparently Cesare liked to present himself as the new Caesar, 
bit of an ego, but what can you expect from obscenely rich elites, right? The amount of detail in these etchings is astonishing. You have eight separate frame scenes, four on each flat, with several inscriptions. It's like turning the blade into a painting or the page of a manuscript. And then it's got this gilded hilt with filigree work and colored enamel. You can tell it's one of those pieces where you keep finding one intricate detail after another the longer you look at it. Next we've got a hunting sword of Maximilian I of Habsburg, uh, Archduke of Austria and Holy Roman Emperor. I'd call this a messer, Craig's messer, like this fellow here. The blade is forged iron with a faceted grind. It's got highly detailed gold enamel on a blue background for contrast on both sides of the blade. The hilt is made of wood, bone, mother of pearl, brass, some of it gilded, and filigree work of cast silver on the sides. It's these pieces here. There you can see the different hilt components disassembled. The precision and attention to detail here is mind-boggling. This all requires a very precise fit, of course, to go together. Here's another one belonging to Maximilian I, a ceremonial sword just as exorbitant. This one is a double-edged longsword. Similar materials and art style here, as you can see, also preciously ornamented. Here's a good look at the intricate patterns. Quite impressive indeed. These were not his only ones, of course. A lot of pretty stuff. You get the idea. She uh, also shows how times have changed. Back then, it was a regal treasure that mere mortals couldn't even dream of. Nowadays, I'm guessing you could probably commission a reproduction like that for around five to eight thousand dollars, which is a lot of money, don't get me wrong, but probably doable for a dedicated collector in the upper middle class. You know, it's no longer reserved for the absolute upper crust of almost deified important people. But you don't always need a variety of precious metals for the wow factor. This is a guarded or hooded Qatar from South India, made of nothing but steel. Definitely visually appealing though. The handle consists of two curved bars that form a palm swell and a third bar in the center with ornamental coves and beads. The guard is adorned with animals and floral motifs in open work design. Imagine cutting out all these patterns and accidentally removing or breaking parts that you meant to leave. Another example, very similar in style but with a reinforced point for use against armor. This design is particularly interesting. It has a cobra head and two dragons? Maybe stylized tigers? Not quite sure, but either way, very respectable work, obviously. If you'd like your precious metals, here is a gold inlaid Qatar from the 19th century. The guard has a half shell in the form of an elephant on top and then terminates in a horse head with raised legs and it's flanked by two large birds. And the face of it is embellished with gilded floral patterns. I'll zoom in here a little bit more so you can see, to see it better. All right, are you ready for an opulent case of ultimate bling? There it is. The ceremonial dagger of Ottoman Sultan Mahmoud I dated to 1732 or 33. It was stored in the stock compartment of this heavily ornamented firearm made by an Armenian master jeweler, right here. The steel blade is damascened with floral patterns and inscriptions, which were scratched into the surface, filled with gold wire and then heated. The blade has decorative cutouts, and is studded with gems like rubies and emeralds. The hilt is made of gilded silver and it's heavily jewel encrusted as well. Pictures alone can't do the dazzling amount of bling justice. This gives you a better idea. Just the way it sparkles in the light and glitters is crazy. I imagine the extravagant lid of the gunstock compartment alone might have exceeded the life savings of a mere mortal. 
The craftsmanship is amazing, no doubt, but it's a tad too excessive for my taste, personally. I mean, generally, when it comes to gold and gems, humans are like magpies. But what about good old silver? This Burmese daw is a great example of what you can do with silver. A daw, by the way, could be either a sword or a knife. You find them in all kinds of lengths. This one is probably from the 18th or early to mid 19th century. This is also linked in the description, just like other sources I've used. The blade's fuller is blackened in a crosshatch pattern and inlaid with floral scrolling and animal motifs in copper, brass, and silver. The handle is made of three segments. Two are iron, and the center one is likely wood. You can't really see the difference because they're all overlaid in silver. The closer you look at this, the more intricate, tiny elements you find. You know, particularly the large pictures here. Like, all of this right here, you know. So many tiny little specks and details all over the place. Like, every... almost every millimeter of it is decorated. The work on the spine here is also very appealing. And what I personally appreciate about this is with all the painstaking work and use of precious metal, it's still made as a functional sword. Now they're saying that the steel quality, blade shape, and balance are all suitable for use, and it definitely looks like it going by the pictures. And finally, I just want to show you another dog with a different type of ornamentation. This 18th century example has a brilliantly carved open work handle of ivory. I always find quality open work impressive, considering the difficulty in shaping it precisely. Even more so in case of something as delicate as this. Just imagine working on this. You know, any mistake you make is going to ruin the piece. So that looks astonishing. That's all I've got for now. I hope you enjoyed a look at all these precious blades in history. Let me know if you want to see more. I can't do this too often, be aware of that, because it's extremely time consuming. You know, finding the pictures is quick and easy enough, but researching information about them and then editing it all together it takes a lot of time. So, yeah, but if you like it, if it's worth it, I'll make more of this. So either way, thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.